Well, thank you very much, Tom, and uh, it's really good to be here with you tonight and with my old mate. Um, and I th hope we'll have a, an interesting conversation. How we thought we'd organise this is that we'll uh, chat for about half an hour and then um, open up to uh, you to make contributions and ask uh, Gareth some uh, probing questions. I found this a very impressive book, uh, a very detailed book, and I think, uh, Gareth, you've uh, mix the, the policy and the personal really well in this account. So while it's a, a meaty, gritty sort of book at one level, uh, it's interspersed with um, stories and um, anecdotes of, of uh, the experiences you've had and uh, a lot of, um, or Perhaps not a lot, but quite a few uh, jokes at your own expense. So uh, I was going to say that I was sure that after hearing Gareth, people would want to go out and buy this book for Christmas, but he seems to have undercut the market by <laughs> giving you all one. So maybe you can uh, buy an extra one for the rallies. Anyway, let me start with a relatively small matter, but one that I think is uh, of some symbolic importance. You mentioned, Gareth, that in your very early political career, you were on a group which judged the entries for the new Parliament House. And you also say that you're rather appalled to see the fence that is currently being erected around that house. But I wonder whether, if you were the Attorney General now, rather than way back when, you would be ignoring the security advice to put up that fence. That job on the jury for the new Parliament House is one of the most fascinating things I ever got to do during my public life, actually working with I.M. Page, John Andrews and a lot of other international superstars. How I got there is an interesting story in its own right because there was a need for a lower house Liberal and a an Senate Labor guy to constitute the appropriate balance on the jury. And none of the old shellbacks in the Labor Party wanted to have anything to do with it. They thought it was a poofterish kind of an enterprise which could uh, be best left to some bright-eyed, bushy-tailed new academic like me. So I jumped at, the, uh, jumped at the chance and it was a wonderful educational experience. But, and I was the one, in fact, that wrote that line in the jury report about we deliberately chose a new building that was not glowering and inaccessible but one that had a genuinely democratic character that took the form of a building that kids could scramble over and people could walk over you know, with their democratic representatives under their feet. So the whole idea of those big grassy ramps and the symbolism of the building was incredibly important. Now once you block off those big grassy lamps you lose all of that and my instinct about what's been done is it's a complete overreaction. Of course you need in the current security conscious environment to put bollards across the bottom to stop vehicles driving up and you know, doing whatever vehicles might be disposed to do. Of course you need security arrangements at the top at the entrance of the building. Of course you need some surveillance cameras and some sort of rapid response capability if something dramatic ever did happen. But the notion of closing it off with those big ugly tall fences and completely undermining the whole concept of the building I think is a complete overreaction of the kind that we're seeing on many fronts, frankly, at the moment. So, more generally, what do you think about the present balance between uh, security and individual rights? We've had all these yeah. rafts of legislation. Have we got it right or have we overreacted very generally? Well, my whole background is as a sort of a very active civil libertarian. I was uh, acutely conscious throughout all the early years of my active public life on the need to get protections of all kinds for civil liberties on a much greater scale than was embedded in our present constitution or legislation or anything else. And uh, I've found it sort of very difficult to accept easily the many, many constraints that are now there. I don't find it all that difficult to accept the constraints on privacy that are now endemic and inherent in our reaction to post 9-11 possible terrorist environment and the possibility of criminal conspiracies 
the absolute need for electronic surveillance and everything else to deal with the, the possibility of uh, people getting together and, uh, and doing terrible things. So we've got to be prepared, and I think the community obviously is prepared, to accept a lot more than what they were willing to do previously. I mean, my, my background in this in the, the unhappy years when I was Attorney General, among other things, included a big attempt to get new privacy legislation embodied in the National Statute Book, which led, among other things, to a massive reaction from your profession, the Fourth Estate, who saw this as a terrible intrusion on the potential you know, capacity, willingness and enthusiasm of the Fourth Estate for infringing everybody's privacy to the maximum possible extent and the maximum number of occasions. So much so that the, um, the New South Wales uh, Journalists Association established, as I vividly remember, an annual Gareth Prize, a Gareth Award for the year's biggest intrusion on free speech. So uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm a bit emblazoned with this sort of uh, anxiety about high principle and the, the downside political risks of that. But I have to say that when I see a Daniel Andrews or somebody appearing on morning television last Sunday and just articulating the case for the most draconian intrusions, open-ended detention for weeks at a time of you know, people who are no more than suspects, and doing so with complete indifference you know, to the, the fact that there's even a, an argument to be made on the other side. I am troubled about that, and I think, the, uh, I think the balance has just gone a little bit too far in the other direction, though we do have to recognise that uh, you know, the environment has changed and community sentiment has changed on this, and people are willing to accept many more intrusions than was the case even just a couple of decades ago. Well, talking about free speech, uh, you expressed some... Uh, concern about 18C. You think that uh, although this was done during your time in the, the Cabinet, I think you were away at, overseas or whatever at the time, Foreign Minister, and didn't take a great part in that formulation, but do think it's gone too far. Yeah, well, God forbid that I should ever offer any solace to Andrew Bolt and the rest of that um, crowd. But I have to say that um, I do think 18C goes too far, as it presently does, by by uh, making actionable um, speech or behaviour which merely insults or offends without necessarily causing any other kind of harm. I think it really is important to have the harm principle centre front when you're dealing with anything involving free speech. And harm can extend to intimidation, it can extend obviously to incitement to violence, but it can also extend, I think, to humiliation, speech which is in its effect, actually humiliating, causing psychological harm. I think there's a legitimate scope uh, for 18C to address those sort of anxieties, but, um, but not beyond that. I mean, we do have to recognise that free speech is really pretty important. And we have to recognise that also in a university context and in the education chapter. I express a degree of alarm about the first signs in Australia of some of this campus enthusiasm for cracking down on speech because of its potential offence to moral or other positions that people have. And when I see you know, talk about, of the kind that's coming from the United States, about no platforming, not giving people a platform to articulate unpopular views, when I see uh, language about um, you know, creating safe spaces uh, for people to learn in which they're not confronted by opinions or curricula that are potentially offensive to their inherent you know, moral view of the world. When I see provisions for trigger warnings and so on, that before anything can be taught, all sorts of anxieties, potential anxieties, have to be addressed. I mean, I do start reaching for my revolver, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I, think, uh, I think all of this is, is dangerous, dangerous, dangerous stuff for the kind of universities that I hope all of us are committed to. And if you can't live with, in a university environment, unpopular, difficult, unconscionable, even ugly uh, sort of points of view being thrown at you, and learning how to react and how to sift what is you know, credible from what is incredible, to learn about the nature of evidence-based argument and so on, then what the hell are you doing at a university? I mean, I don't think we should be insulating people from those dilemmas and difficulties. We should be exposing them to it. It was a very difficult, very different environment in our day, uh, Michelle, when uh, 
so far from demanding that we not be offended, we, as a generation, were doing our best to cause offence on <laughs> multiple fronts, and uh, it was a uh, fun time to be alive. Although in the early 60s, I think, as opposed to the later 60s, uh, it was all uh, a gentler sort of offence. Yeah, it was gentle. I mean, you and I were involved in, and I was involved in student politics. You know, in the I was very passive. You were, you, were, you were head down and tail up and, you know, focused inexorably, or, which you've been doing ever since brilliantly well. But, um, no, I mean, in the, the pre-Vietnam days, I mean, the issues were, um, were you know, it was, pro, it was anti-censorship, it was anti, um, you know, sort of pro-abortion law reform, anti-apartheid, pro-Indigenous rights, Aboriginal rights and so on, pro-education reform, and these were the sort of issues that were exercising my generation of student activists. The Vietnam stuff came a bit later and a lot of the, uh, the more robust, I suppose, uh, campus environment, but... Um, well, I was there. by that stage a tutor at Monash and it was certainly robust. <laughs> Can I um, take you forward, though? Um, you spent time, obviously, as a senator and a member of the House of Representatives. You spent, spent the whole parliament, but most time in the Senate. And I wonder whether you think that if you were in today's Senate, as opposed to the Senate then, uh, it would be as easy to be a minister to, to handle no, it'd be very difficult, and as I say somewhere in the book, very difficult for someone like me whose temperament is not of the cloth from which Zen masters are cut. Uh, uh, not quite what's needed to deal with those um, that, that said, I mean, for all the reputational damage I've suffered over the years for being cantankerous, um, Generally speaking, I've only been cantankerous on little things, on trivial things, on irrelevant things, on dopey things, and on the big stuff. Um, I've always been very focused and sharp, and whenever there's been a big and difficult negotiation of the kind that I had to deal with on multiple occasions, as particularly as leader of the government in the Senate, including the native title legislation, for example, which was fiercely contested by the opposition and took 50 hours of committee debate and all-time record then. I mean, to lose your cool in that kind of context would be totally counterproductive, and I don't really think I did, although someone was quoted as saying in the book, he, he did say fuck a lot after midnight, but um, <laughs> only, only in private between consenting adults, not, not more than once anyway in the chamber. But um, no, the, the, the Senate environment of the May was very difficult then because you had um, you know, the West Australian Greens in particular who observed no known commitment to any previously understood form of rational discourse. I mean, they were just on a, they were, they were on another planet. They, they were idealistic, they were committed to doing good things, but they had no sort of concept of how to translate that into actual legislative outcomes. And as so often with Greens ever since, I mean, the best is the enemy of the good. And emissions trading scheme, Malaysian solutions on refugees and so on, we've seen that over and over. And that was, that was a problem I had with that group. And um, I had to rely very much on people like Brian Harradine and others um, who, although were, were difficult, um, at least were capable and susceptible to rational argument. It's more difficult now. I mean, the, the conventional cliche, which I embrace, of course, in the book, is to refer to as akin to the bar scene in Star Wars. But, um, and it is, it is difficult with that litter of, of very eccentric and idiosyncratic uh, people you have at the moment. More difficult than it was in my time. But I think, you know, you just have to deal with that as best you possibly can. And while rational argument and debate is not a, uh, a, necess not a sufficient condition, it uh, uh, still is a necessary condition in the Senate. And that's what makes the Senate different still, I think, uh, from the House of Reps, where you know, third-rate vaudeville is the norm and nobody gives a damn about you know, the credibility of the, the rational argument. It's just not required as long as you've got the numbers. Now, you do suggest that one strategy in today's world perhaps should be that uh, oppositions while stating they're, uh, that they're opposed to things, don't vote as much against measures. Do you think that the level of partisanship has reached uh, unmanageable proportions? Yeah, I think, I think it has in the sense that there's an obligation to oppose any damn thing at all coming from the other side because you lose your credibility, you lose your base somehow, unless you seem to be contesting everything down to the last vote in the last chamber. 
I think that's a very big turn-off uh, for most of the Australian public. And the further distant I am from the day-to-day -day business of politics, and the more you look at things, you know, from a distance, and you, and, you know, the disposition of ordinary non-political people is to say, "Oh, this is crap," and they're just not interested in who's commanding, you know, four fifths of the day's news cycle. I mean, which is something that obsesses politicians, and they've got to command Kevin Rudd classically every two hours. They've got to have a story that's ahead of the game. Nobody gives a stuff out there in the wider community about that. They really don't, and there's a bit of a hunger for some show of decency. And part of the show of decency, I think, is is having the courage to cooperate, having the willingness to say, OK, you got elected to do X. Uh, if we were in government, we'd do you know, X differently. Something like you know, the Gonski debate, as we can all recently remember. But you know, we, will, we won't oppose it. In government, we will do better, uh, but we're not going to stand in the way. That doesn't mean, of course, you rush to the centre ground on everything and abdicate any capacity to identify ideological difference or you know, policy difference. Of course, that still leaves a heap of room to do just that. But the notion of that everything is, you know, is contested, has to be as contested as it has been, I think is just a misreading of what people want from the political process. And there's one of the reasons why the major centre-left, the major centre-right parties, not only in Australia, but in most of the democratic world, have been dramatically losing ground to single-issue parties and to more sort of overtly idealistic parties who do want a different quality of politics. Now, obviously, a lot of your book's taken up with um, foreign affairs, your time as uh, foreign minister and your impressive record in that area. So let's uh, just turn to the international scene. You argue for Australia to have a more independent foreign policy, and uh, perhaps that's particularly relevant in the times in which we find ourselves. But can you just outline where you see that going? How or how should that go? Well, in simple terms, I articulate it now as less US, more Asia, more self-reliance. Less US doesn't mean walking away completely from the alliance. That would be a quite wrong-headed thing to do, given the degree of benefit that we generate in terms of intelligence, logistics support, and whatever the deterrent existence of the United States capability might amount to. But it's sure as hell, not least in the, the present environment, it sure as hell means not succumbing to that you know, disposition to follow the US down every cul-de-sac and every rabbit hole simply because that's what we perceive the great and powerful is to be wanting us to do. I mean, the situation has become more obviously pathological than it's ever been with the present incumbent in the White House. And uh, I have to say, one of the more implausible denials of the last generation has been um, Tillerson's denial that he said effing moron about, uh, about, uh, about Trump. I mean, there's lots, lots more language, and I've been guilty of uttering a fair bit of it myself that one could say about Trump. But the truth of the matter is the United States, in recent months, has abdicated global leadership, abdicated global moral leadership on issues like climate change, has completely walked away from the kind of soft power that the United States has traditionally exercised, has behaved totally erratically, totally alarmingly on multiple fronts. And, you know, whereas whither thou goest, there we goest, um, might have been, you know, pretty good both theology and politics in more distant past. It ain't very good politics at the moment. The US has made some shocking mistakes within living memory in Iraq and going back to Vietnam before that. And obviously they're capable of making many more. So the notion of succumbing to the American hubris that the Americans have got to stay number one uh, in the global bloc and uh, completely, I mean, even Obama, for God's sake, even before Trump, you, know, you may remember Obama saying of the Trans-Pacific Partnership issue, we make the rules. China doesn't make the rules, we make the rules. And that kind of approach in the present environment, with China exercising the muscle that it is, wanting the space that it so obviously does, deserving the space that it so obviously does, not only strategically in the region, but also in the global rule-making environment. They don't want to be rule-takers anymore, they want to be participants in rule-making. To just sort of ignore all that and keep on pressing is, is not a, a world that we can be comfortable in. So, but at the same time, if I can just complete that little story, I mean, I do think it's not a matter of walking away completely from the United States and embracing the attractions of a of globally powerful, regionally powerful, and economically fantastically important China. It is a matter of 
of not being a Chinese patsy either, any more than we should be an American one. And in particular, I worry about the Chinese disposition to just push the envelope in many ways to unacceptable limits if there's no pushback. I mean, the Chinese would love to create, recreate that kind of hegemonic relationship with their neighbourhood, that tributary relationship when everybody kowtows in where they used to two or three hundred years ago. And they will do just that, and we're seeing them trying to do just that in Southeast Asia in particular, and maybe Central Asia now as well, unless there's some degree of pushback. So perhaps surprisingly for some people, I'm an advocate of pushing back against the South China Sea stuff, for example, having freedom navigation operations, not just in the main commercial sea lanes, that's easy, but within 12 nautical miles of those little reefs on which the Chinese are building military installations and against the, the ground rules of the international order, they have no sovereign claims over it. And uh, you know, we, we should just not let that go without protest. And I think the Chinese, and I know them pretty well because I've been negotiating with them for many, many years on many, many different topics. I think they, they will respect a pushback. They, they, don't want, they don't want a confrontation with anybody. Uh, but they will push the limits as far as they can go without getting to the stage of violence. Now, I think I should let you quote yourself on uh, your assessment of Mr Trump. Yeah. And perhaps you can uh, just outline where you think uh, all that's going to go in the United States in the next year or so. Well, I was thought to be a bit over the top when a couple of months ago at the National Press Club I described Trump as being the uh, least informed, least prepared, most ethically challenged and psychologically ill-equipped uh, person ever to occupy the White House. I have to say now, two or three months later, that seems like an understatement. <laughs> uh, and the fact that, um, you know, so many... I mean, Bob Corker, you, you will have seen that, that line of his just a couple of days ago, Republican, senior Republican, saying the White House reminds me of an adult daycare centre in which the staff have gone missing. Um, and I see in the book you also add ignorant vulgarian. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean narcissistic vulgarian. I mean, every, everything, everything you can possibly say about Trump is, is true. It's just beyond parody and it continues. It continues and it gets worse. The only thing you can say, and what makes me an optimist, and let's come back to the title of this, um, because you know, I haven't said much which perhaps justifies it, but we are seeing an astonishing level of pushback already. We're seeing all those checks and balances which are a central feature of the American system working in spades at the moment. They're so often a frustrating feature of the American system. And we, and for many, many years, we've said parliamentary systems are better because executive governments can get on with the job without all the constraints of congressional majorities blocking them. And, they can sign treaties and so on. But for God's sake, when you see a Trump emerging in the way that he has, you just pray for the continuation of those checks and balances and you applaud the kind of pushback that we're seeing, both domestically and internationally. So I'm reasonably optimistic that the Trump phenomenon, like so many other ugly phenomena in the past, will be reasonably transient. But there's clearly 35% or more of the American electorate rusted onto this narcissistic Bulgarian ignoramus and are not going to be persuaded to vote against him under any circumstance unless the Democrats and others can get their act together and come up with a credible storyteller telling a credible alternative story. You know, we might conceivably be in for yet another four years of this horror, but um, it's, you know. And just before we move off foreign affairs to uh, on, onto education, you are reasonably optimistic about the North Korea situation, given given all we're hearing. Yeah, because I mean I've dealt with the North Koreans. I've been involved in some of those negotiations going back as foreign minister in the mid 90s, and again when I was running the International Crisis Group in the in the 2005-2006 period when we got very very close to a deliverable deal. And I've always been totally persuaded that the North Koreans are wholly about regime survival and personal survival of the, the leadership of that regime. And while they will play the game with incredible sort of recklessness, they're not under any circumstances going to be the first to fire off either a conventional weapon or let alone a nuclear weapon because they know, leadership knows, that to be homicidal is to be suicidal. And to that extent, I don't mind Trump particularly and those around him saying, <coughs> as they have been in recent times, <coughs> if these guys attack anybody, any of the allies in the region, then you know, the place will be turned into a car park. That's, that's variations on the traditional 
deterrence theme and it's, it's not a bad message to, to get across. But the only rational approach to dealing with this is a combination of containment, including the sort of sanction strategies that have been evolving internationally now for a number of years, deterrence of the kind which has been articulated in terms I've just expressed, but also keeping the door open for negotiations. It is possible to negotiate a decent outcome of this. It's probably not possible now to negotiate complete denuclearization of the, of the North Korean arsenal, but um, I think it's certainly possible to negotiate a freeze. And it's just nonsensical for the level of rhetoric to have escalated on the American side to the scale that it has, in which you know the whole notion of any kind of... Uh, of talking to these characters has been has been ruled out. I mean that is just just crazy. And there are some cooler heads around Trump, um, and I I sort of believe that at the end of the day they will prevail. But obviously reckless speech has its own potential consequences if you if you escalate the emotional environment to the point where what might otherwise be a fairly routine you know aircraft manoeuvre, a bomber flying very close to North Korean airspace, it you know it's conceivable that it would be perceived as the first wave of a, of a nuclear attack or something which would generate a military response which then creates the escalatory spiral. And, uh, and we know from all too many anecdotes that have emerged from the Cold War period about how even in the best managed supposedly command and control system you can get very, very close to uh, you know, nuclear exchanges as a result of system error, human error, human idiocy and now compounded by the possibility of cyber sabotage and so on. So the risks are real, but in terms of deliberate, deliberate embarking on an aggressive war, I don't think it's going to happen any more on the Korean Peninsula than anywhere else in the world at the moment. I think those days are past. Now, in the last few minutes, let's come to your present job and tell us uh, about how one is a good chancellor and how one... Um, I choose the word, maybe not carefully, how one manages a vice-chancellor. <laughs> You've had a few. Well, I've had some fascinating experiences with vice-chancellors. Um, I mean, Chubby was, I suppose, the, uh, the real test for anyone to encounter coming into the job for the first time because uh, Ian Chubb, as some of you will know, will know, and he wore this like a badge of honour, and he won't be offended at all by me now saying this, Chubby had an absolute contempt for governance in every shape and form. Uh, he abandoned the, uh, the academic board. He created all sorts of mechanisms which involved people reporting directly to him. He treated the council as, uh, <laughs> you know, just in a way that uh, you know, makes the old mushroom club language sound, you know, rather weak by comparison. I mean, Chancellors were all right as long as they knew their place, but that just hadn't been dug yet. And um, uh, it was a very difficult environment. And, and, you know, with my sort of temperament coming up against Chubby's sort of feudal warlord temperament, um, uh, it pretty obviously would have ended in tears had our relationship continued much more than the 18 months or so that it did. And even then, there were a few occasions which were only to be observed by consenting adults in private, I think, uh, when issues of accountability, transparency and the... Yeah, so that, that, was, that was chubby. So that was a very interesting starting point. But then, um, then I had Ian Young, um, Ian the gent, um, as he was constantly described. Lovely guy with a, you know, utterly uncharismatic, but with a total commitment to good process, uh, administratively in governance terms and without generating much excitement around the campus, was a first-class sort of person to deal with in recreating some semblance of a governance environment. Now, now with, uh, with Brian Schmidt, I have to say, I think I've got the best of all possible worlds, a, a charismatic uh, you know, Nobel Prize winning Vice-Chancellor uh, with no previous administrative experience other than running a five or six man research team, which uh, led, of course, many people to say uh, to me in airports and elsewhere, courageous decision, Chancellor, courageous decision. Uh, but it wasn't because um, I've now got a, a vice chancellor with an IQ and an EQ uh, to match, and a willingness also to roll up his sleeves and deal with the nuts and bolts of, you know, the reality of, you know, 80% of his time being occupied by whinging academics and, um, you know, all the rest of the stuff. So it's, it's been a fascinating experience for me. But look, what, what's involved in all of this, in, in making the relationship work between a chancellor and a vice chancellor? is an understanding of mutual, of, of territory. Who's, whose job is what? And you've just got to get this very, very clear. And the corporate model is the only way to think about it. The chancellor is the chairman of the board, responsible for strategic direction, 
oversight of the effectiveness of the managerial system without getting involved at all in anything remotely managerial, and oversight of the financial and risk situation to ensure that there's responsible risk finance management. That's the job of the Chancellor, that's the job of the Council. There's a few little fuzzy grey areas in the middle, and when those grey areas arise, you just have to talk them through, work them through. But if there's mutual respect and if there's mutual understanding of where those basic boundaries are, I mean, it should be a relatively painless process. And my experience is that it has been. I think I suspect that's been the experience of most of you around the room. I don't think this is really astrophysics. I don't think it's rocket science. I mean, I think it's, it's just something that's plain common sense, developing a working relationship. I also have the benefit of having been, after I left politics for 10 years, CEO rather than chair of a significant organisation, the International Crisis Group, a $20 million organisation with 150 highly strung, cantankerous uh, personnel doing global conflict stuff, and working to a very sophisticated board with very impressive chairmen, people like Chris Patton, now Chancellor of Oxford, uh, Tom Pickering, very famous <coughs> American diplomat. So I knew, coming to the job as Chancellor, I knew what it was like to be your CEO, working to a board and very strong chairs, and and that I think was a very useful experience to have, uh, you know, coming to this. If you have seen it from the other side, but it's it's really not all that hard. But I've, I've written a lot of stuff in the chapter on education about you know my experience about this and what I think the ground rules ought to be. But that's it in a nutshell. Um, hopefully, we can tease out the education. Uh uh, issues a bit in question time. Just one final question. You talk about the need for more diversity in our university system. Can you just elaborate briefly on that before we turn it over to everyone else? Well, the interesting thing about the Dawkins revolution is that it wasn't particularly intended to create uniformity. If you go back and look at what he was writing and saying at the time, there's an interesting new book coming out on that, edited by uh, Stuart McIntyre and others be published in a month or so. Uh, but that's what it created. It created, I mean, there was a rush to, for everybody to embrace the same sort of disciplines, for everybody to have this sort of model of both teaching and research. And, you know, the pressures, the institutional pressures generated by the new funding system, the new organisational system, were towards uniformity. But in the in the real world, we're not, all, we're not all good at everything. I mean, I'd love to think I was good at languages, but I was lousy at languages. And that's a, you know, for, I'd love to think I was brilliant at economics and numerate stuff, but I wasn't. And I found that out when I was sort of shadow, you know, treasurer. I basically hated the job and it showed. And I think it works for in institutions too. I mean, some of us are better at doing stuff than other stuff. And it's not a matter of, um, you know, what's more exalted or less exalted, but I do think it is important that we recognise the need for diversity in the higher education system generally, but the university sector uh, in particular, and to recognise that we need, certainly as a country, uh, to have a significant core of genuinely elite institutions by international standards of elitism, you know, research reputation and so on. And that we're only going to get there if we've got a little bit more flexibility in the funding system and so on that we have at the moment. So in that con I mean, we, you know, we don't worry about elite sporting teams. I don't think we should worry about having elite universities. We should strive to have you know, half a dozen Australian universities in the top 50 if we possibly can, or better than that. So I was in favour in that context of, of fee deregulation, which I know is not very popular among many of you around this room because I thought it would create the opportunity in an environment where governments were not going to be generous um, in terms of throwing money at elite institutions or potentially elite institutions, and where we had not sufficiently developed a philanthropic instinct in this country of a kind which there obviously is in the United States, which, makes, which does a huge amount to make elite institutions possible. I thought the only way forward of guaranteeing that sort of financial support base was through um, you know, the capacity to impose higher fees uh, and let the market then you know, work from there. But of course there are huge access and equity implications of that and you can't go down that path without having the same sort of, of scholarship support that there is in the United States institutions for very high paying, fee paying institutions and how do you get that in an absence of a philanthropic culture is a really difficult, tricky question which we haven't fully resolved. So there are all these issues in play. I think most of them are, are now uh, you know, passe for the time being. Nobody wants to revisit this. All of us are on the same page. 
when it comes, I think, to resisting the, the funding cuts that the federal government is now proposing, which are frankly just totally unconscionable, not least in an environment where it is the case that we rank number 30 out of 34 in the OECD in the higher education public investment. As an attempt to sort of say those statistics are botched or wrong or whatever, I've looked at this pretty carefully, they are right. We are measured as a percentage of GDP, we are 30 out of 34 in the OECD in terms of the public investment in higher education. Now that is unsustainable for a country going into the kind of economic universe that all of us are confronting for the period ahead. So we have to exercise collective muscle on this front, not get too exercised by the things that divide us, focus on that which unites us. And uh, I hope that by doing so, uh, we can guarantee a decent future for this sector to which all of us, I think, in this room are pretty passionately committed. Well, with that clarion call, can I open it up to uh, questions? And, people's uh, tolerance is up to it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I better keep mine, I guess, unless, Michelle, you'd like to take over? <laughs> so. Who's to start? Gareth, I'd be interested in your views around the challenge we now face with Chinese students. Mm. It's very clear that they are absolutely fundamental to our export industry. And yet there is increasing evidence at many of our universities that uh, the behaviour of some of the students we have is not what we would expect in the sort of open university environment that you're talking about. And I was wondering, as a chancellor, how you think we should try and get this balance? I don't have an instant coffee answer to that. It's a dilemma that all of us are confronting. I mean, obviously, particularly those universities whose whole funding model has become crucially dependent on that massive cohort of international students and Chinese students in particular. We're less in that position than most others, but if you take a particular discipline like business and economics, you know, we're extraordinarily heavy, not only in internationals, but in Chinese, and you not only have the risk factor that that tap will be turned off. You not only have the educational risk issue of a sort of a ghetto in which we're not giving you know, people a genuine Australian experience, we're not giving the Australians a genuine educational experience. Um, we're all familiar with that. And now we're becoming increasingly familiar with this other issue of uh, you know, the sort of constraints that are being posed by an increasingly active and assertive Chinese government that uh, makes it clear that there's various kinds of behaviour they regard as tolerable and others that are not, and that's um, spooking out a fair number of our students. We've got to be very careful about what we say about all this you know, publicly, yeah. and I'm not at all sure what the strategies are to deal with this privately, but um, I mean, one, s one approach to this, of course, is to diversify our international student cohort. We're doing that to some extent with much more attention to South Asia, and there's a huge potential market there, which we're only beginning to tap on the Chinese scale. But also, I mean, Indonesia, for God's sake, we, we just still haven't got our heads around the fact that Indonesia is sitting up there with 250 million people. It's going to be the fourth biggest economy in the world and most projections by 2045, certainly by 2050. And we just don't get it. I mean, Australian business doesn't get it. You've seen those suggestions, or those figures, which there's more Australian investment in New Zealand than there is in the whole of ASEAN put together and um, you know, a lot of the rest of Asia as well. And there's just, but you know, there's, there's a huge cohort of uh, potential you know, students there, which I think we need to be much more aggressively tapping just to sort of at least diversify uh, the group that's, that's causing us that concern. Next, who's next? <coughs> Gareth, uh, I'm interested in <coughs> talking about the, particularly the Chinese the dependence we have on foreign students from China. We also hear that China is developing new universities that are a huge rate of knots. Is there a significant risk that the Chinese government may at some stage do what they did with gambling and put the foot down? on Chinese people coming to countries like Australia for tertiary education. Is that a serious risk 
Yeah, yeah, it is, and it's not one that's necessarily contingent on us being perceived to do something wrong. It might be just a function of them deciding that they, uh, you know, want to divert more students to the domestic institutions, which are growing, as you say, at a dramatic rate. And and in an in an educational environment, which is also changing at a dramatic rate. I mean, I think it's quite interesting to read some of the stuff I've been reading recently, which you may have too. We say, you know, the traditional stereotypes about Asian education and Chinese education in particular, that it's not, you know, encouraging creativity, it's, you know, rote learning, feeding ducks and all the rest of it. This is just no longer the case, certainly not at the university level or the major institutions that are now showing up in the, uh, you know, the major rankings. But it's also increasingly true of the, the secondary sector as well. So we, we, we just comfortably sit on those old stereotypes at our peril, I think. And we've just got to factor in that, that risk factor. I mean, a lot's going to depend on how Xi Jinping approaches his, his next term. And I think a lot of us are watching very, very closely this, uh, this Chinese, um, you know, the big political convention that's uh, going to determine the next leadership cohort and whether it signals a consolidation of a completely sort of authoritarian model or whether it's the beginning of a having consolidated his authority, whether he's going to move to a more relaxed and open sort of environment. But um, it's, that's an awfully big bet that this is going to continue, this flood of financial support for our system. It's an awfully big bet that that's going to continue on the scale that it has. And anyone paying serious attention to risk factors in our internal governance structures has to be weighing that risk very, very highly indeed and, and working out contingency plans to deal with a, a cut off of that tap at almost any time for almost any reason. It's Gareth, two weeks ago we had a discussion about um, Kim Jong-un and uh, Trump and I think at the time I commented that I thought that your enthusiastic optimism uh, seemed a bit strange when you're dealing with two lunatics. Um, and, uh, With haircuts only their mothers could love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, but I noticed that, that over a period of two weeks it's now shifted to cautious optimism. And I, I know your view about the homicide that has led to suicide in terms of Kim. Can you give us a bit more detail about the sort of constraints that prevents Trump using the codes? Well, I mean, formally, there's no constraint really at all. If he can locate his biscuit, the little plastic thing with the code on it, and Clinton famously lost his for six months. I mean, since he was in the habit of mislaying his trousers, this is not entirely inexplicable. But, um, uh, but this, um, yeah, this is the thing which, you know, the president carries around, which then feeds into the, the famous football, the satchel. And technically, and because of the principle of complete civilian supremacy over the military, once that you know, code is fed in, you've got a very, very rapid chain of response down the line and the guy sitting out there in the silo or launching the bombers you know, just presses the button. But I think all that said, you know, what I'm hearing from mostly off the record is that such is the level of anxiety in the high places in the US system, in the military system in particular, that there's a growing sense that any order of this kind that came from Trump would generate a flurry of counter responses in the sense of seeking approval from Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, going to Kelly, the Chief of Staff, is this what the President really meant? Which would not be, not be the, um, you know, the sort of re expected response, and thank God for that. I mean, it's very troubling for someone who's you know, passionate about governance and, and you know, deeply troubled by the notion of the, uh, you know, having these sorts of control mechanisms ultimately vested in, in military authority rather than civilian. That's against every conceivable precept. But these, these are very peculiar times. And we have not had, and we've not had in American history, 200 plus years of American history, anyone remotely as you know, as ignorant and irresponsible and manifestly ill-equipped for the task as this guy uh, in a, a, an environment that is as sophisticated and complex as the present one. So, I mean, uh, you know, I think on the American side, that, that is the, the hope that notwithstanding that, that system, uh, there will be internal countermeasures, counter-pressures, counter-responses.
which were neutralised. On the on the Korean side, I can't say anything more than I've said before. I mean, I've I've dealt a bit with these characters. They're a little bit more sophisticated than they come across in some of the uh, you know, some of the caricatures. Uh, whether Kim Jong Un himself is particularly sophisticated is another question. But I don't think there's any doubt about his commitment to um, you know to regime survival. And the point is, they already have a huge deterrent capability with that ring of fire they've got around Seoul. I mean, and which the South Koreans are acutely aware of because they've been living with it for decades. I mean, there's a because Seoul is within 30 k's of the, uh, the DMZ and the, the border, uh, the, Chi the North Koreans have been able to tunnel into the rock there, multiple, multiple hundreds and hundreds of tunnels uh, with artillery, weapons and rockets, which can just shower down on Seoul in a matter of minutes. And the expectation is that probably they could kill 100,000 people in South Korea within 30 minutes, 45 minutes if the North Koreans, you know, press those buttons. That's without relying on nuclear weapons or anything else. So there is a deterrent capability which is already there. To the extent the North Koreans are, are sort of seem to be passionately attached to nuclear weapons, it's more for psychological reasons than any other sort of rational reason. And just generally, I think the, you know, the situation is, is manageable because of that, you know, set of realities that um, nobody really is going to be wanting to, you know, to press the button first. Little, you know, least of all the North Koreans. Can I ask a very quick supplemental? Isn't the circumstances you described with respect to the United States in those circumstances uh, a coup d'etat? A coup d'etat in the United States? Well, you just described a, a if you like, a rebellion by. Well, I mean, if. if, if well, if Trump was put in a straitjacket and marched off to jail, that would be a coup d'etat. But if there's somebody just saying we're going to regard this order as the functional equivalent of yet another bloody tweet um, <laughs> and, uh, and see whether you feel the same over breakfast tomorrow. That's not a coup d'etat, that's just rationality. And I think um, you know, there is an element of, of rationality that is, that is there elsewhere in the US system, which um, I just hope, trust and pray will cut in. But, um, you know, I mean, as, as bad as things are, I mean, I do think there are these counterfactors at, at work. I mean, the, the wider point that, you know, and the reason I'm an optimist and it keeps on, you know, sort of coming through is when you look at these individual situations, you look at the horror in Syria and various other parts of the Middle East and Africa, and when you look at the, the anxiety we all feel about the North Korean situation at the moment, it's very easy to sort of lose a sense of historical perspective. And really the world is a rather safer place now than it has been, you know, in decades, centuries, certainly past. It's not only a better place in terms of poverty and, and, and standard of living and so on, with a gigantic number of people taken out of poverty, and we're reason to be optimistic about that. But also when you look at the basic trends in conflict, from up there to down there, when you look at the basic trends in terms of atrocity crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, when you look at the basic scale of human rights violations, it's just easy to forget the massive numbers of people that were being killed in cross-border wars, internal wars, genocidal crimes like the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia or Angola, or, uh, and to you know, sort of forget that we have been making progress. So in that context, I think it's important not to get you know, too carried away, but to focus on what the opportunities are for curbing the worst instincts and moving forward the better, which are out there in the wider international community at the moment. Another question? Henry. 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 Gareth, can I bring you back to the domestic front? Um, given that the Senate was originally established as a House of Review and representative of the states of which this uh, is supposed to be built around, hmm. um, and now it's completely a single issue hmm. organisation, is there, is there any way you can actually bring the Senate back to having some real value? as a House of Review and as a representative of the States? Well, not as a representative of the States. I think those days, <laughs> uh, those, those days are just basically gone. I mean, the, the culture has changed so, so fundamentally that that's just not the way the world has worked for many decades before. It no, it's, it, just, it just never has. It didn't even get past the first decade of the, the new century before they started voting on on party lines or on issue lines rather than state lines. So that's, that's chasing a will of the wisp, I'm afraid. But in terms of getting some sanity back, I mean, partly it's, it's getting the larger story right of the major centre-left and centre-right parties recovering ground, recovering credibility with good storytellers, good stories, 
and basically creating less attractions for the fringe dwellers to go off and find solace in fringe dwelling parties. Uh, that's an important, you know, sort of core part of the strategy. I mean, beyond that, uh, I think there's not much you can do by way of changes to the system that would inherently improve things. I mean, I'm in favour of fixed four-year terms of a kind that um, would limit the downside risks of, of um, irresponsible sort of double dissolutions and so on, because a newly, if a, if a government is forced to the polls, then you could only see out the term of its predecessor. And uh, if you have, uh, then there's an issue, of course, whether you have four-year terms for, if you go for four-year terms for the lower house, whether you have four or eight for the, for the Senate, if you have four-year terms um, matching the house, then you, increase the possibility that the composition of the Senate will match that of the House at any given time and you'll get less crazy fringe dwellers. But on the other hand, if the quota systems are maintained and everybody is elected at the same time, the, the quotas will reduce and you've got a bigger chance of you know, rats and mice getting into the Senate um, than is the case if there's only half a Senate elected at a time. So all these complicated equations have to be talked and thought through. But none of this is really going to be fixed by constitutional reform fixes, not least because of the difficulty of ever getting any constitutional reform through the system. I think it's just got to be fixed by a change in the political culture, the political environment, and that takes us back to the responsibility of the major parties. I mean, if anyone listened to Barry Jones last night on or whenever it was this week, Philip Adams talking about the Courage Party and this, you know, quixotic enthusiasm for some new, you know, political force that can somehow take over from the from the morally spent major parties. Um, yeah, I mean, that sounds nice, but it's, I think it's frankly totally undeliverable. The hope must lie with the major parties getting their act together, and that's the case in every democratic uh, country in the world, I think, um, at the moment. And that means good storytellers repeat with good stories. And what counts as a good story, I have to say, I still think to this day, some contemporary variation on what made the Hawke Gidding government so successful, so emulated by the Blair government and others, namely that combination of rigorous, disciplined, dry, competitiveness, productivity-oriented economic policy, because that's where we've got to be in the contemporary world, but accompanied by very warm, moist, compassionate social policy, compensatory social policy, so people are not left behind by that dry economic stuff, and then liberal internationalist sort of foreign policy. It's a compelling combination if you can get that right. And I think Macron in France did exactly that, whether that'll prove sustainable with the, the backlash that's being generated with the union movement and so on there is an interesting question. But that's the kind of thing I mean by, you know, some decent storytelling. A narrative which appeals to, you know, without having to be too sophisticated out there, appeals to people's sense of justice, sense of fairness, and sense that their stories are going to be listened to. If you just play the hardline economic game uh, and don't take account of the, those being left behind, increasingly a bigger problem in this, not because of globalisation, but because of digitalisation and the technological revolution. If you're not paying attention to those voices and not coming up with new strategies to deal with those concerns, well, you deserve to be in the wilderness. But I think the major parties just have to, just have to be much more focused on finding that sort of common ground. And as part of the story is where we began the conversation. I mean, being much more willing to go for, to accept good policy, including elements of good policy which come from the other side. Because if you get your turn in government and you've done nothing but pour crap upon everything that's come from the other side of politics, it makes it that much harder to get a free run uh, yourself. And that's the sort of bind that we've got ourselves into with this sort of you know, race to the bottom in terms of the way politics is conducted. Um, so that's my real solution. I don't think there are any technical fixes. I think we've just got to improve the quality of politics. And if we do that, you know, I think the rats and mice will disappear or at least be far less prominent and central to the operation of the system than they are at the moment. Whew. Are we... I'm sure there are a couple more. Well... <laughs> what about over here? Win yeah, Winston. Gareth, I can't uh, resist asking you the question. You were Foreign Minister in 1987, when the first coup took place in Fiji. Yeah. Changed the trajectory of things in the Pacific, and also in relation to the New Guinea. Uh, what's your take now, looking back on the events then, 
and uh, how you see what has happened in relation to the stability of our region. Well, what happened in Fiji was obviously very troubling with the Rambuka um, coups and so on, and um, I wanted to maintain a lot more pressure um, on that post-coup regime than the market would in fact bear around the South Pacific. Um, when, we, when we took strategies of that kind, I remember the South Pacific Forum and elsewhere, basically the, the strong view was this is an internal affair of Fiji, uh, you know, as long as the situation is stabilised, nobody's being, you know, executed or imprisoned, but there might be an authoritarian regime there. Keep your, keep your cotton-picking hands off it, Australia, because, you know, we're oversensitive about your capacity for imperial overreach. So, and I'm, I'm, I don't think we did as much as we could to keep the pressure on the pro-democracy movement in Fiji and with results that we are still playing themselves out today. I mean... Elsewhere, I mean, uh, Papua New Guinea was a very, very difficult situation to handle. Well, I was in the middle of the Bougainville situation as that emerged and erupted. Um, that's reached a sort of modus vivendi with a lot of help from the New Zealanders, I have to say, who were able to play a negotiating and mediating role, which was beyond us because we had, were seen as having too much skin in the game. I think the way in which we've handled uh, the Solomon situation, um, which is very much a Howard government enterprise, and um, you know the Ramsey operation, I think that was... That was well done, um, and it was you know, a credible response to an internal situation which did effectively stabilise it and won a degree of local support. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I haven't followed events as closely as I should. I'm going to be watching very interestedly the New Caledonia uh, referendum next year to see whether, which was another major issue back then and which has gone to sleep for you know, two decades while we're waiting for the referendum process to work itself out. Uh, it's, I, I paid a lot of respect to the uh, South Pacific Island countries and uh, deliberately sort of embraced a view which said, I'm not going to start with making my first trip to Washington or New York or London or wherever, I'm going to start in the South Pacific and build out you know, from there because those relationships are fantastically important and they depend on a degree of you know, personal respect and, and uh, understanding. And uh, I think we did that you know, sort of reasonably well. And when I, when I look at when Gordon Bilney became the South Pacific Affairs you know, sort of minister as well as the aid minister, I think we did it even better than when it was just a small part of my responsibility. But it's, it's sort of okay, but uh, it's a troubling situation. I mean, many of these South Pacific countries are facing existential issues, obviously, with climate change, Kiribati and the rest of them. And, uh, you know, and we haven't solved the problem of economic viability. We haven't solved the problem completely of political democracy stability. But whether Australia can do any better in that respect, I'm just not sure anymore. So I uh, welcome your advice on that, Winston. Do we have one final killer question to... Off. Killer question. I'll, I'll ask a final question. I'm not sure if it's a killer question. <laughs> uh. Can I bring you back into education, uh, mm -hmm. Gareth? And I was yesterday. I was at the National Press Club listening to Jennifer West mm. talking about higher education. And one of the contentions of the business world at the moment is that the higher, uh, the higher education or the tertiary education system is not generating uh, graduates that are job ready, career ready, whatever the right terminology is. Do you think this is a real problem or is it, a, it, is it not a real problem? If, and if, if it is a problem, what should, how we should we be responding? Well, I think part of what Jennifer was saying yesterday in terms of giving greater respect and credibility and muscle to the VET sector is unanswerable. Absolutely unanswerable. They've been the, the poor relation of higher education in you know, recent times and that overtly vocational you know, stuff um, is, you know, pretty important as what business wants and what the community needs and, and we've just got to respect that more. Now, whether the sort of voucher system, lifetime accounts, which you can move backwards and forwards to different sectors and top up and whether there should be, you know, financial limits on that, we can argue about all of that, but at least it was a, a worthwhile contribution to the debate. If the debate takes the form of going down the path you say, that the whole of the higher education system ought to be vocationally sort of focused or outcome focused or or job readiness focused, uh, rather than you know, playing the traditional role of educating people to understand the nature of evidence, the nature of argument, the nature of you know, scientific um, discovery and process, and then you know, to be equipped to apply those intellectual skills and understanding to new kinds of problems, new kinds of situations. 
I mean, that's what, to walk away from that um, is to be, you know, abdicating not only the traditional role of universities, but what must be the continuing role of universities. I mean, I passionately believe in that. Uh, getting governments to believe that, getting some of the business crowd to you know, accept and understand that is, uh, is tricky territory, but, you know, we, the university sector, have to insist on that traditional role of universities of educating for just quality understanding of of life and you know what matters and values and and the, you know the, certainly the skills i mean i'm mathematical skills and linguistic skills and humanities evidence appreciation are all part of that but um the notion of you know being job training factories is 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 just that's nonsensical when we all know that people are going to have, you know, maybe 10 different jobs and or more in their, their lifetime in the future. And what we need are generic skills that um, will equip people for that. Um, none of this is to say that universities should re retreat into a kind of, you know, ivory tower in which it's, you know, only the research that, you know, the most disembodied academic wants to do is sort of valued. I mean, I think it's totally fair to be bringing into the equation impact factors and rewards for impact, rewards for policy impact, I mean, which is something the ANU is very passionate about, given our status as a national university, working very closely, you know, with governments on a lot of issues. And there are perhaps insufficient rewards in the traditional academic system for research and activity, which has a, a strong, practical, real-world, you know, policy focus. And that's that's something I, I believe in as well, but but equally, there's something fundamentally important about the traditional Newman sort of idea of the university, which I think we really must hang on to, while all the other pressures are out there as well, and we have to find ways of accommodating them too. Gareth, yeah. thank you very much. It's been great hearing from you. I'm sure everyone will agree, and also incredibly refreshing to hear an optimist in a time when we mostly hear pessimists. <laughs> So thank you again on behalf of everyone. Thank you.